Um, welcome everyone uh, to, to my presentation uh, about, yeah, we will talk about unknown impurities uh, in drug substances or in drug products, and especially those um, who come unexpected. And we will try to get uh, an ID of these unknown compounds uh, with, with mass spectrometry. Um, I think the, 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 the context is easy. We will talk about uh, drugs that are already years on the market uh, and suddenly a new impurity is detected in the QC analysis. And you, as you can see uh, on this example on the slide, for years you have uh, a quite normal QC analysis or a QC analysis appearing as, as the black uh, LCUV chromatogram on the top. Uh, and suddenly you encounter an impurity that is never seen uh, before. And that obviously causes uh, a red flag in the organization. It's an auto specification and yeah, the batch is, is on hold. Uh, actions need to be defined. Uh, root cause analysis is, is started uh, and so on. So it's, that's pretty annoying. The core issue in fact is the, the toxicological uncertainty about that new impurity because the, the patient safety is, is no longer assured. Um, and yeah, you need to know that uh, an impurity, it can always be uh, potentially toxic, uh, who knows even uh, mutagenic. Um, depending on the concentration relative to the active pharmaceutical ingredient, so the API, and whether it's detected in drug substance or drug product, uh, thresholds apply for uh, thresholds to report to the impurity to the authorities or if the impurity needs to be identified uh, or even if it needs to be qualified. Um, before going deeper uh, into the identification part, uh, I want to show some background related to the possible origin of impurities. And what we see here is uh, a kind of tree classification of uh, the classification of different pharmaceutical uh, impurities. And the first classification is based uh, on the chemical nature of impurities. Impurities can be uh, solvents, can be uh, organic or can be inorganic. Um, in this presentation, we will mainly focus on organic uh, impurities. And organic impurities, um, they can be either uh, drug related, uh, they appear mostly in drug products, or they can be process related, where they appear mostly in drug substances, or they can be contaminations. Um, and now in the next couple of slides, we will uh, uh, discuss each category uh, slightly in more detail. So first we have the drug related impurities, which are related to uh, the API. And these impurities, um, they evolve uh, during long time storage of, of the drug product uh, because of chemical reactions of the API involving uh, temperature, uh, oxidation, uh, humidity or light or a combination of, of such factors. And in fact, during drug development, uh, I think companies, they perform a, a theoretical modeling uh, of the possible impurities that can be formed. But for sure, also, they perform uh, stability studies, experimental, uh, which is an experimental assessment uh, where the drug product is stored at real use or accelerated storage uh, conditions and where the impurity levels uh, are monitored. So, and on the right hand side of uh, the, the, the slide, you see an example of, of ibuprofen, a well known uh, anti inflammatory drug, uh, and 17 of its uh, known. Uh, drug-related impurities. Then we have uh, process-related uh, impurities. Uh, in fact, they originate or usually originate from the synthesis of the API, so hence the, the production process of the drug substance. And we see on the slide the various uh, sources of such impurities indicated in green we can have uh, impurities that are already present in the starting material. Uh, we can have residual solvents that are used in the process. Uh, during the synthesis, uh, intermediate, uh, intermediates uh, can be insufficiently removed or chemical site reactions can happen uh, as well, leading to uh, 
other uh, structures or other uh, yeah, molecular structures than the intended uh, drug substance. Um, normally, uh, I think all these process impurities, they, they are extensively investigated uh, uh, by the company making use of uh, probably a less pure drug substance, for example, uh, than that used uh, for the real uh, production. Uh, so after such extensive uh, impurity profiling, if you can call it like this, uh, so a new unexpected process related impurity um, is in fact, or should be not so, not so likely. And then we have uh, the last uh, category of, of organic impurities, which are the contaminations. And yeah, you can think already if uh, unexpected impurities if they are not expected to be drug related or process related, then there should be contaminations, right? Um, yeah, indeed, uh, it's a more likely source for uh, totally unexpected impurities because they are more challenging uh, to keep uh, under control or fully under control. And I think a special attention is required for uh, leachables. Uh, because these are impurities that migrate out of the packaging or out of manufacturing equipment that comes into contact with uh, the drug product. And at one hand, we have the container, which is in direct contact with your drug product. And the container can already consist of many different plastic components, um, as well uh, as many different uh, manufacturing materials where it uh, can come into contact. We have for example, storage bottles or bags or o-rings or tubings. Uh, so from all these manufacturing equipments, uh, potential leachables may end up uh, in your final uh, drug product. Because there are so many uh, parameters or so many test items uh, or items that it can come into contact with, uh, it's more challenging to keep, to keep this fully uh, under control. So now we come back to uh, the what now uh, question. Um, so we have the different thresholds. If, you, if a new impurity emerges, uh, if it's below the identification thresholds, that means that an identification is, is not mandatory for uh, the regulator. But I think as a company, uh, you want to anticipate uh, on uh, the next uh, incident. And also I think it's, you want to find a root cause of, of a new impurity or an unexpected impurity that emerges. So identification is a key step uh, for, for, for that root cause uh, analysis as well. Obviously, if your impurity is above the identification threshold, you need to identify it. And above the qualification threshold where a toxicolog toxicological assessment is required, uh, also there, uh, identification is a key step. For example, if you need to perform um, a QSAR, well, for a QSAR, you need, uh, you need a structure. Uh, so identifying the impurity is, is for sure a critical step uh, in the whole uh, de-risking process. Now, how to identify uh, an impurity and Again, we are talking about organic impurities. Um, there is no strict guideline or cookbook available for structural elucidation. I think that every company or every lab, they develop their own protocol, they develop their own strategy for identification. Um, but I think in most uh, labs, a general uh, scheme can look as, as it is shown uh, on the slide. And first we start with the typical uh, QC methods and QC methods are very often uh, LCUV methods or GCFID uh, methods. Um, they must be such methods, they must be able to detect impurities, um, but they focus on the quantification uh, aspect. And uh, you have some information for identification, for example, the, the retention time that is obtained or, or the UV, spectret, uh, UV spectrum. But yeah, this, this information is often too limited for uh, to come to a complete uh, structural elucidation. So for a full identification, uh, in most cases, the method it must be translated to a mass spectrometry compatible method. 
Um, this can be straightforward, but in some cases it's not so straightforward. Uh, and mass spectrometry methods, whether it's um, LCMS or GCMS for uh, more volatile compounds, uh, you can use uh, multiple uh, ionization techniques. And multiple ionization techniques are suitable, uh, or each ionization technique is suitable for a particular range of compounds. They also have different uh, principles. Uh, so if you can combine them, uh, they offer, uh, offer often complementary uh, information. Um, owing to the, the high resolution and accurate mass uh, you obtain for a compound, uh, so we have uh, uh, multiple decimal, uh, decimal tickets uh, available, you can determine the elemental formula. And from there, or with additional exp uh, MS experiments, you can uh, come to a full uh, structural elucidation. However, if it still doesn't work, or if MS uh, is inconclusive, uh, you can go to NMR, which is for sure an alternative uh, powerful identification technique. Uh, but in general, it is less sensitive compared to mass spectrometry. Uh, it's also not so straightforward when an impurity is present um, in a complex matrix. Uh, so it might be required to isolate uh, and upconcentrate uh, the impurity of interest. Uh, and this process can be rather uh, laborious, time consuming, costly. Um, so it's not always uh, freely available. So how does it work? Uh, an identification based uh, on mass spectrometry, and, and don't be afraid, I will not go into too much technical details of, of uh, mass spectrometry, but there are uh, various uh, elements of mass spectrometry uh, experiments, but also uh, you use supportive information, uh, or in some cases you use supporting information uh, to come to a full uh, identification. And you can run over the, the different parameters uh, quickly. We have high resolution and accurate mass, um, and they uh, provide you with, with separation of, of closely related masses and also determining the, the elemental uh, formula of, of your molecule. Uh, depending on the ionization uh, you use, um, you can use that to determine or to confirm uh, the molecular ion. It all starts with determining uh, the molecular ion and, and its formula. Tandem MS MASP or MSMS uh, is used to induce uh, fragmentation to the molecule and analyze uh, the fragments uh, that are formed, also with accurate mass. And they can provide you, uh, or for a mass spectrometry expert uh, in interpretation, uh, he can uh, from there deduce uh, or propose a structure. Uh, but there are also uh, alternatives uh, or alternative experiments possible, like different uh, sample treatments you can, uh, or sample de uh, derivatizations you can perform uh, to rule out or to confirm uh, particular functional groups. You can perform literature search uh, as supporting evidence or to find supporting evidence. But next to the mass spectrometrist or multiple mass spectrometrists, um, you can also bring in a, a drug chemistry expert uh, that can search for you or uh, think along the way of the potential origin. And let's not forget about the chromatography part uh, as well, uh, the LC or the, or the GC, because retention time, uh, it can uh, sometimes, or it, it, it does some, or it does provide some uh, insight in the polarity of uh, the molecule. So that's, that, that's a long story. Uh, it's only in CSI that uh, an identity appears on the computer screen a few seconds uh, after analysis. So, but in reality, um, there are many experiments that are performed, each uh, bringing a piece of the information that is needed to, to puzzle your structure uh, together. And much comes from yeah, the capabilities of the instrument uh, and the expertise of the, of the mass spectrometrist as well, as well as uh, other chemists and material engineers uh, to think along the way. So in the second part of the presentation, uh, I will show a summary of, of four cases uh, of uh, MS-based identifications of unexpected impurities. And in the first uh, case, uh, we start in fact with the same chromatogram uh, as was shown on the first slide. Um, so it was for, for a sponsor uh, and suddenly 
they detected a new impurity uh, in the drug product. And at that stage, they had uh, no idea of the origin. So that was a total surprise. Luckily, the, the uh, LCUV method was directly uh, MS compatible. Uh, but however, uh, none of the used um, ionization techniques could confirm the molecular ion. Um, and yeah, information about the molecular ion, this is key information uh, you need for, for the identification. And um, unless or contrary to, to GCMS, you can, uh, there are no universal LCMS libraries available. However, yeah, some open source LCMS libraries, they start to emerge. Uh, but opposite to, to GCMS, where the spectra are very reproducible, uh, the appearance of, of LCMS spectra, they can be different between uh, different systems and mobile faces used. And yeah, there are also other parameters uh, that influence the, the appearance of a mass spectrum. So that's not so uh, straightforward. Um, to find that confirmation of uh, the molecular ion, we used a workaround uh, via GCMS. Um, and that helps, uh, such workaround helps if you have a drug product batch available uh, not containing the impurity. So if you have a good blank, you can perform uh, a differential analysis. Um, and that means that you only look to uh, peaks uh, in the chromatogram that appear in your batch with impurity and not in the batch uh, without uh, the impurity. Um, based on that, you can make a selection of candidate uh, impurities. Um, you can search uh, the GCMS spectra against uh, different uh, libraries uh, that can be uh, in-house libraries, like we have the Nelson in-house database, uh, but also uh, commercial libraries like, like the NIST or, or Wiley. So in this case, uh, we obtained uh, a very good match with the compound that is present in our uh, in-house library. And even it was coincidence that the, the, the mass spectrum appearance uh, is in fact very similar to the LC-MSMS uh, spectrum. Um, but that's coincidence. I think it's, that's rather coincidence. Uh, it's not always the case because uh, LCMS and GCMS, they use different ionization uh, mechanisms. So we uh, took that compound as our candidate for uh, being the impurity, but you still need to confirm it, uh, of course. Um, although it, it is a confirmed identification on, on, on GCMS, you need to uh, you need to analyze a reference standard uh, of the compound uh, with the original LCUV uh, method uh, and confirm uh, the compound uh, with the retention time, the UV spectrum, and also if you can uh, confirm your compound with, with, with the mass spectra, uh, the LCMS uh, method as well. So in this case, we confirmed uh, the, the impurity as being uh, uh, for that pentyl uh, phenol. Uh, for each case, uh, I added one slide uh, with, with the key takeaways, just not to, 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 lose, uh, uh, to, to lose the control of, of everything. Uh, so uh, regarding impurity control, uh, there was in fact an, an existing leachable data set uh, on the old material grade, but a change in the material grade for uh, that particular container component uh, led to uh, a new leachable that emerged. So the change control procedure uh, in that case, it did not foresee in that potential new reachable uh, as a consequence. And from an uh, analytical point of view, we have seen that uh, LCMS data, it sometimes lacks uh, key information, like here the, the confirmation of the molecular uh, ion. So it's always good to extend your analytical toolbox to, to other uh, chromatography uh, mass spectrometry techniques. In the second case, uh, which is about uh, adding a new manufacturing site for uh, an existing drug product. Also here, the drug product is, is, is controlled by means of uh, an LCUV uh, method. And after analysis of the first uh, two uh, batches from uh, test batches, in fact, from that new manufacturing site, uh, two new impurities uh, emerged. Also here, same story, uh, never seen before. Um, so they requested us uh, to identify the impurities. Um, for the first 
uh, unknown. Um, I think we were almost as fast as, as CSI. Uh, because we were lucky that, that the, the sponsor method was directly uh, MS compat compatible as well. And the MS uh, spectrum, it gave an immediate hit with a compound that was present in, in our in-house uh, compound database. Um, obviously, uh, you lack a, a good retention time correlation between uh, the, the method of, of, of the sponsor and uh, our own uh, screening method uh, on LCMS. But it's clear that um, the appearance of, of the accurate mass and, and the mass spectrum is, 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 is quite similar. So our impurity was uh, identified. It was also confirmed later on as being uh, dichlorobenzoic acid, uh, which is a typical leachable from uh, peroxide cured uh, silicon tubings. So what happened is that the filling station at the new manufacturing location, it used peroxide cured silicon tubing instead of, of platinum cured uh, silicon tubing, uh, which does not uh, give off uh, that particular leachable. And the compound uh, was also further confirmed by uh, an ethanolic extraction of uh, that uh, peroxide cured silicon tube. The first unknown went very fast. Uh, the second unknown was more of a challenge because uh, we did not obtain a corresponding signal uh, on MS uh, of the UV peak with none of the ionization technique or so not in positive or negative mode. So uh, then it's what now? Um, again, uh, we used a workaround. Uh, this time it was uh, via Headspace uh, GCMS for, for volatiles. Um, and this technique uh, led to the detection of uh, a potential candidate uh, and that candidate impurity uh, was identified as toluene. And toluene, yeah, it's a common solvent used in a wide range of industrial products like, uh, like ink or disinfectants, paint. Um, and also the identification of toluene uh, was later on confirmed uh, with the LCUV method. And to toluene, uh, why don't you see it on, on LCMS? Uh, well, it's first of all too uh, apolar for LCMS, so it, it does not ionize with, with ESI or APCI uh, ionization. And also, um, most uh, methods, they start at, at mass 100. You can go lower, but if you start at mass 100, uh, it, just, it simply falls below uh, the mass range. So what did we learn here uh, in terms of impurity control? Yeah, that you need to check the finest details uh, when you implement a new uh, manufacturing uh, site. So only uh, yeah, um, a, a small uh, detail like uh, the, the grade of the silicon tubing of your filling station uh, might impact um, your, uh, uh, your impurity profile. Um, for the solvent impurity, that is less clear. Uh, solvent impurities like toluene, they may originate uh, from many possible sources. Uh, analytically, we have seen that not all the peaks that are detected with LCUV, that they give uh, a good response on LCMS. Uh, that is because of the different uh, mechanism of, of detection. Um, and But if you have a large in-house compound database available, uh, and obviously here at Nelson Labs, we have a large compound database, which is full of, of extractables and leachables, which is our key, uh, key business here. Uh, we see that it provides a significant advantage in, in uh, the identification process for uh, such unexpected uh, impurities. But the third case, uh, a discoloration issue um, and such issues also, I know it from my, my, my previous work, uh, Discoloration issues are a headache for, for analytical chemists uh, because they often occur at, at a very low uh, concentration level. So uh, you cannot see uh, an additional peak in the LCUV or the LC visible range uh, method. Um, and in that case, uh, the sponsor, uh, it, 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 it was an oral uh, liquid uh, drug product. Uh, the, the solution turned yellow uh, after contact in, in uh, the container closures, the, the, the plastic bottles. 
uh, and the discoloration does not appear in the solution that was stored in, in the glass bottle. Uh, so that immediately hints already towards uh, a leachable. Um, such discoloration issues, um, although you don't see a peak on, on the LCUV chromatogram, uh, they have an immediate impact on, on the perceived uh, quality. It's a visual out of specification. Um, and for such or to find the root cause, you really need uh, sensitive analytical methods to find uh, comp the compound that is responsible for uh, the yellow color. Um, in that case here, uh, we again used a differential uh, analysis of uh, the, the drug product that was stored uh, in, in the glass bottle. This is our blank uh, or the control. Uh, and we also uh, analyzed the drug product that was stored in a white bottle or a brown bottle, but we see that the peaks and the peaks in the GCMS screening, the numbered peaks are uh, compounds that are present in the solutions that are stored uh, in either the white bottle or the brown bottle, but are not detected in, in, in the blank. Um, also with LCMS, uh, you can apply a differential uh, screening analysis. And in fact, we saw that there was uh, one compound that was uh, both detected with GC and LC. Uh, they, are, they are indicated with the blue uh, rectangles um, and it drew uh, our attention. Um, the peak, it, it was identified as uh, HMF. Um, and HMF is a compound um, that is usually associated with Maillard uh, reactions. Uh, so Maillard re reaction products from sugars uh, in food. So the, uh, the Maillard reaction gives uh, the, 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 the brown and the tasty uh, crust to, to your meat if you fry or, or if you bake it. Um, HMF has a light yellow to yellow uh, color. So it it's, uh, might be responsible for uh, the, the yellow color that was observed. Uh, and what is really a good hint was that uh, the drug matrix contains uh, fructose. So here we have uh, the sugar uh, that can potentially uh, react towards uh, the HMF. Um, but if that hypothesis, hypothesis is true, uh, then in fact it's not a leachable because it's formed out of reaction in, in, uh, in the drug product. There seems not to be any link with, with the container. Uh, so how you can how you can explain that uh, that's not so easy uh, or that's that's not su such an easy case for a root cause analysis. A possible explanation can be that uh, the reaction uh, might be induced or might be catalyzed uh, by uh, other leachables uh, and other leachables they can cause uh, a, a shift in the pH, uh, for example. The final concentration was approximately uh, 5 ppm, so uh, such that, that confirms that such kind of issues, they, they occur at uh, very low concentration levels. So we learned that a very low level of uh, a new impurity, uh, it can lead to a visual uh, auto specification. Um, and leachables might not be directly, are not always directly responsible uh, for uh, being an impurity, but they also can lead uh, to a change of the pH or even a color change uh, in that case, uh, causing an auto specification. Uh, also here, uh, we could only, or we were able to identify uh, the potential candidate uh, for the yellowing uh, owing to our in-house uh, database. So we had an immediate uh, retention time and uh, spectral confirmation with uh, a reference standard. And then we come to uh, our final uh, case. Again, it is a typical case of uh, an unexpected impurity. Um, it suddenly pops up in, in in a, in a routine LCUV analysis for QC purposes. And in that case, there was a recent change in the overpouch. overpouch. And the overpouch is uh, secondary packaging, uh, which is not in direct contact with, uh, with the drug product. The problem in that case here was uh, that the LCUV method was uh, not MS compatible uh, at all because the LCUV method uses um, uh, non-volatile buffers uh, and salts. 
uh, and that is not uh, directly compatible uh, with MS. And then, in fact, you have uh, two options. Uh, you can translate the method to uh, a fully MS compatible method and try to keep uh, the same retention time uh, behavior. Um, or an alternative option can be to perform a hard cut two dimensional LC analysis. And in fact, that means um, that you isolate uh, the UV peak uh, and inject it into a second uh, dimension uh, method, LC method, which is uh, MS compatible. And for us, the, the second option is in fact preferred because as the second dimension, we can use our own uh, LCMS uh, screening method. Uh, that is also directly coupled to our uh, in-house database. But we were not so fortunate in that case. There was no immediate uh, hit with our database. Uh, so that means uh, that further uh, expert identification is required. Um, it starts with uh, determining the elemental formula of, of, of the molecule, uh, which was uh, C22H22O10 uh, in that case. And in the next step, um, you can perform uh, the tandem mass spectrometry analysis. And this is here uh, a typical example of uh, an MSMS analysis with uh, the fragments that are assigned uh, of the proposed uh, structure. And what happens in that experiment here is that uh, we fragment the molecule in uh, the collision cell of the mass spectrometry of the mass spectrometer. And then we measure the accurate mass of the resulting fragments. And based on that, uh, a mass spectrometry expert, he, he, can, he or she can propose a uh, structure. And also, uh, nowadays, we are aided by modern software that can predict uh, the fragmentation pathway of a proposed structure uh, and tries to match it with uh, the observed uh, fragment masses. So in this case here, um, our uh, unknown impurity, it was first tentatively identified as uh, a PET-related compound. Uh, and that was not so surprising because uh, over pouches, they frequently contain uh, a layer of, of polyethylene uh, terephthalate. So at that stage, it is still a uh, tentative identification. So that means that you still need to confirm it uh, by, again, analyzing uh, the reference standard of the proposed structure uh, on the original LC uh, UV method. And you see on the screen that uh, the retention time matches uh, perfectly. So what did we learn uh, here that uh, regarding it was a, a case of, of leachables again, and you also don't need to consider only the primary packaging, which is in direct contact with the drug products, but also secondary packaging uh, through permeation. It may lead to new impurities in uh, the drug products. So you really need to include or to perform a kind of risk assessment uh, of uh, the, including your secondary packaging uh, in the change uh, control. That was analytically a more uh, demanding uh, project uh, where uh, you need skilled analytical experts uh, to tackle such complex structural elucidation uh, tasks because you need to overcome uh, your non-MS compatible LCUV uh, method and uh, manually interpret uh, the obtained mass spectra. So here I come uh, to the conclusion of, of, of the presentation. Um, we have seen that uh, if we run structural elucidation projects for uh, unexpected impurities, uh, very often uh, they, these, these impurities are in the contamination uh, category, like uh, leachables or residual cleaning uh, agents. And frequently, a, a very small gap in a change control allowed the unexpected impurity uh, to emerge. Identification is the, is the critical step uh, for the safety assessment, but also for the root cause uh, analysis. Um, and there is no clear uh, how-to guideline, how to identify uh, an unknown. Um, every lab or company is, uh, is free to develop its own strategy uh, with the available experts and, and technology. 
uh, for this category of, of impurities, uh, our job is made easier because uh, from our extractables and leachables work, we have an extensive leachable compound database. Uh, and because many unexpected impurities in, in this category, uh, this database helps us uh, for a quick identification, if possible, uh, of such unexpected uh, impurities. Um, I can recommend a lot of uh, good handbooks if you want to know more about uh, mass spectrometry or mass spectral uh, identifications. Um, I, I just want to refer to one uh, very practical guide uh, around uh, mass spectral interpretation workflows that was written uh, at Nelson Labs. Um, it used the identification of, of extractables and leachables as starting point, but in fact, uh, I think that the whole uh, workflow and principles, they are broadly applicable to, to other applications uh, as well. And with this, I want uh, to thank you for your uh, attention uh, to this presentation. If you have any uh, questions afterwards, uh, you can still email me. Um, and now I go back to, to Marcus for, for the Q&A session.